For 17 weeks past, Orson Welles and the Mercury Theater on the air have brought you Mr. Welles' own dramatizations of literary classics, both of the past and from our own time. On all broadcasts but one, the presentation has been a single narrative. On one occasion, the Mercury players offered in dramatic form three of the world's great short stories. The success of that experiment led to nationwide requests for other brief narratives of contrasting emotional appeal. And so tonight, in their 18th broadcast, Orson Welles and the Mercury Theater on the Air bring to life two famous short stories, each dealing with a different fundamental human emotion. The authors are Joseph Conrad and Clarence Day. Tonight, Mr. Wells will not only appear in several parts, but will also speak for the two authors as narrator. And here, ladies and gentlemen, is the star and director of the Mercury Theater to tell you about the first presentation, Mr. Orson Wells. Good evening. There was a man called Karszynowski, an agitator for Polish freedom in the 50s, who was exiled by the Tsar. On the journey, his child was taken ill, and when he begged an official to let him stop on his way to nurse it, the official said, not to bother. What's one baby's life among all these thousands, said the official. If it's dying, leave it behind. Luckily, this expedient was found unnecessary, and the happy ending of the story is that little Joseph Conrad Kaszynowski lived to drop his last name and to learn that careful, fortunate English which he practiced to the everlasting glory of our literature. Tonight we present you with a dramatization of one of the best regarded and most typical of the works of Joseph Conrad. The Heart of Darkness could be described as a deliberate masterpiece or a downright incantation, a fine piece of prose work at the least. Its best aspects are an artful compound of sympathy for humankind and a high tragical disgust. Its successful contrivance of mood hides its craft as an octopus hides in its own ink. And almost we are persuaded that there is something, after all, something essential, waiting for all of us in the dark alleys of the world, aboriginally loathsome, immeasurable, and certainly nameless. made, the wind was nearly calm, and being bound down the river, the only thing to do was to come and wait for the turn of the tide. The sea reach of the Thames stretched before us like the beginning of an interminable waterway. In the offing, sea and sky were welded together without a joint. The air was dark above Gravesend, and farther back still it seemed condensed into a mournful doom brooding motionless over the biggest and greatest town on earth. Then in the darkness, my friend Marlowe spoke. This also has been one of the dark places on the earth. His remark didn't seem at all surprising. Marlowe was a sailor. It was just like him. I was thinking of very old times when the Romans first came here. Nineteen hundred years ago, some decent young citizen in a toga, perhaps too much dice, you know, coming out here to mend his fortunes. Land of the swamp, march through the woods, and in some inland coast feel the savagery, the utter savagery that flows around him.
growing regret, the longing to escape, the powerless disgust, the surrender, the hate. I don't know if I ever told you I was in such a place once. There I met a man just like that. A long time ago. I had a job with a concern at the time, a trading society in Western Africa. One of their captains had been killed in a scuffle with the natives. They needed a man to replace him on one of the river boats, and they weren't particular whom they took. I left in a German steamer, and she called at every port on the way. It was 30 days before I saw the mouth of the big river. The coast was the edge of a colossal jungle, so dark green as to be almost black. The sun was fierce. The land seemed to glisten and drip with steam. Here and there, grayish-white specks showed up, clustered inside the white surf with a tin shed and a flagpole. And all around, the jungle. You know, it's funny, Mr. Barlow, where some people will live for a few francs a month. Well, it looks like a dreary country, Captain. No mistake. I wonder what becomes of those fellows when they go up country. I expect to see that soon. So, sure. Don't be too sure. Last year, I took up a man who hanged himself on the road. He was a Swede. Hanged himself? Why? <laughs> who knows? Sun was too much for him or the country, perhaps. There's your company station. I'll send your things up. Four boxes, you said so. Very well. Good luck to you. Goodbye, Captain. As I climbed up the steep hill to the company station, I met a white man in such an unexpected elegance of get-up that in the first moment I took him for a sort of vision. I saw a high starch collar, white cuffs, a light alpaca jacket, snowy trousers, a clear necktie, and varnished boots. No hat. Hair parted, brushed, and oiled under a green lined parasol. Mm. You are Mr. Mallow? Yes. And the company's accountant here. Sit, sit into my office. What's that? You don't disturb yourself. An agent from up country. Fever. Will you just leave him there? Yes, there is no place else to put him until he... Well, as long as he's alive. It's a nuisance all around. His groans distract my attention. It's difficult enough to guard against clerical errors in this country. Yes, I suppose so. So you are going to the ivory country, Mr. Mallow? Interesting. I've gathered that impression already. For my part, I like books better. Entries and all that. And by the way, uh, you'll meet Mr. Kurtz up there, you know. Who is Mr. Kurtz? Mr. Kurtz is the agent at the father's station inn. He sends down more ivory than all the others put together. That just make him a valuable man to the company. Mm, indeed, he'll go far, very far. Over the heads of many of us that... Well, I won't go into detail. Uh, when you see Mr. Kurtz, please tell him that everything is very satisfactory. Uh, I'd write him, but you can't tell who might get hold of a letter at the central station. Oh, I forgot the sick man. I don't know, it's all right, he doesn't hear do you mean? Oh, no, 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 not yet, not yet. Yes, yes this, uh, this Mr. Kurtz is a very remarkable person. Next 
next day, I started for the central station, 200 miles inland. Paths. Paths everywhere, spreading over the empty land, through the long grass, through thickets, down and up chilly ravines, up and down stony hills ablaze with heat and solitude. Great silence around and above. On the 15th day, I came in sight of the big river again. Hobbled into the central station. It was on a black water surrounded by scrub and forest. With a pretty border of smelly mud on one side. And the three others enclosed by a crazy fence of rushes. White men with long sticks in their hands appeared languidly from amongst the buildings. They made no effort to welcome me. In fact, paid no particular attention to my arrival except for a casual glance. I walked up to the largest hut in the enclosure. How do you do? My name is Marlowe. Captain Marlowe of the riverboat. Oh, yes. You've been a long time coming, Marlowe. Your boat is wrecked, Captain. What did you say, sir? Wrecked. A bottom was torn out on stones and she sank near the south bank. But everyone behaved splendidly. You will have to fish her out. It will be some time before you will be able to make the trip up the river. For some months, in fact. Well, that's unbelievable. You'll believe it when you see her. I want you to have a look at her and let me know how soon she'll be ready. Who are you, sir? I'm the manager here, the company's manager. The situation here is grave, very grave. I don't yet know who is dead and who is alive. And with the boat laid up, we don't know how things stand... But there are rumors, grave rumors, that a very important station is in jeopardy. And Mr. Kurtz, our manager, is ill. Kurtz? I think I heard his name down on the coast. Ah. So they talk of Mr. Kurtz down there, do they? They do? He must be a very unusual man. Quite so. A very unusual man. Very successful, too. You can understand my anxiety. You should be ready to start... In three months. Yes. Three months. That ought to do the affair. Went down and looked at my battered, twisted tin pot steamboat. She rang under my feet like an empty biscuit tin kicked along the gutter. I didn't realize at the moment how accurately the manager had estimated the time required for the affair, as he called it. Weeks of waiting. Weeks of waiting for a box full of rivets to come up from the coast. And in those weeks, I saw the station full of white men with long sticks in their hands, strolling aimlessly about like a lot of faithless pilgrims bewitched inside a rotten fence. The word ivory rang in the air, with whispers and with sighs. You'd think they were praying to the great god ivory. I've never seen anything so unreal in my life. One evening, I happened to be in the hut of the assistant manager. I noticed on his table a small sketch in oils representing a woman draped and blindfolded carrying a lighted torch. Uh, tell me, uh, did you paint this? Uh, oh, no, that was painted by Mr. Kurtz in the station more than a year ago. Mr. Kurtz painted it while waiting for me to go to his trading post. Oh, Mr. Kurtz, eh? Mr. Kurtz is the chief of the inner station. Oh, he's a prodigy. He sends down more ivory than any of our other agents. Besides that, he's an emissary of pity and science and progress. And so, so he comes here, a special being. So today, Mr. Kurtz is the chief of the best station. Next year, he will be assistant manager. Two years more and... Ah, uh, but... I dare say you know what he will be in two years' time. You're one of the new gang, Captain. Oh, I know what I'm talking about. I have my own eyes to trust. <laughs> you read the company's confidential correspondence. What do you mean? When Mr. Kurtz is general manager, you won't have the opportunity. Well, the rivets arrived just in time to make good the manager's prediction. In three months, almost to a day, I set out to the interior to relieve Mr. Kurtz at the inner station. Heavy, sluggish. There was no joy in the brilliance of the sunshine. As we stood.
steamed deeper into the jungle, the roll of drums behind the cordon of trees kept a distant, constant tremor. Drums on behind us, ahead of us, on all sides of us. Steamer toiled along slowly on the edge of a black and incomprehensible frenzy. The prehistoric man cursing us, praying to us, welcoming us. Who could tell? Not far below the inner station, we came upon a hut of reeds, an inclined and melancholy pole with the unrecognizable tatters of what had been a flag of some sort uh, flying from manager and I, who went ashore, found a flat piece of board with some faded pencil writing on it. Red. Hurry up to inner station. Coach, Foster. There was a signature, but it was illegible. Not foot. What do you make of this, Captain? Someone trying to be mysterious. Approach, Foster. Approach, what? Foster. You better put on the right side out. We're only eight miles from Kirk now, aren't we? Eight miles of danger to the river. Some is getting low. After this morning, I prefer to approach the station by daylight. But Kurt may need us. He may be in trouble. I hope not. It wouldn't sit well with the company if something happened to Mr. Kurt before we reach. Is your only concern what the company thinks? Just what do you mean? How about Kurt? Don't you want Kurt to come back? Why? Captain Marlowe, what an extraordinary notion. Of course, we want Mr. Kurt to come back. Such a remarkable man. When the sun rose next morning, there was a white fog, very warm and clammy and more blinding than the night. It stood all around us like something solid. At eight or nine, perhaps, it began to lift as a shutter lifts. We had a glimpse of the growing multitude of trees, of the immense matted jungle with the blazing little ball of the sun hanging over it. At last, the opaque water, still and treacherous, was dimly visible from the wheelhouse where I stood beside my pilot. The company men, their alpaca suits, whiter than the fog, stood on the deck below me. All right, we'll go! I'll be now! Hey! Ya Rabbana! Ya Allah! Allah! Ya 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 Allah!
poor devil. He's got an arrow sticking through his chest. Give me a hand with this arrow. Oh. Steady there. It's got a steel tip. Strange. There's no steel in the Belgian Congo. I wonder if by any chance, Mr. Kurt... was becoming an obsession with me. The current was more rapid now. The steamer seemed at her last gasp. The stern wheel flopped languidly. And I caught myself listening always for the next beat of the engine. I expected the wrecked thing to give up every moment. It was like watching the last flickers of the light. At last we drew into sight of a dreary shore, and it was a clearing that rose to a slight knoll overlooking the river. The inner station was a long, tumble-down building perched on a hill, half buried in the high grass, with a thick, meshed jungle hanging over its rotted roof. I stopped the engines. The boat drifted slowly to the slimy bank. We let out the anchor chain to the stump of a tree. As soon as the gangplank was lowered, the company's manager and his three satellites set out with their brisk efficiency toward the silent house of Kurtz. After a moment, I became aware of a strange, ragged figure on the wharf. Hello down there. Captain. Come up here to the pilot house. Captain, I'm glad you've come. Did you come in time? How is Mr. Kurtz? Mr. Kurtz, sir. Still Mr. Kurtz. You were just attacked by natives on the river. Oh, yes. They are simple people. They meant no harm. It was one of Mr. Kurtz's little jokes. Now, allow me to introduce myself. Sikasov, Russian. Son of an archpriest. Government of Temple. A great pleasure to talk with a white man, Captain. Don't you talk with Mr. Kurtz? Well, you don't talk with that man. You listen to him. Mr. Kurtz, Captain, has enlarged my mind. We've talked of everything. Everything. He made me see things. And ever since, you've been with him, of course. On the contrary. Very often, I had to wait for days before he would turn up. It was worth waiting for, though. Sometimes. What was he doing? Exploring, or what? Oh, yes, of course. He's discovered many villages of late, too. And they're not sure exactly in what direction. Dangerous to inquire too much. Most of these expeditions were for ivory. He had no goods to trade with by that time, did he? There's a lot of good cottages left, even yet. You mean he raided the country? Not alone. Kurtz got the tribes to follow him, did he? Oh, they adore him. They think him a god. They worship him with ivory. <laughs> what can you expect? He came to them with thunder and lightning, you know. They've never seen guns before. He could be very terrible. You can't judge Mr. Kurtz as you would ordinary man. Now, uh, just to give you an idea, I don't mind telling you he wanted to shoot me too one day. But I don't judge him. Shoot you? What for? Well, I had a small lot of ivory and he wanted it and wouldn't hear reason. He said he'd shoot me unless I gave him the ivory and said, out. I gave him the ivory. Of course, I did. But I didn't say it out. I couldn't leave him. I offered to go back with him and he would say yes and then he would disappear on another ivory hunt to get himself among these people. To get himself. You know. Why? The man's mad. We don't say such things here. I followed the frightened glance of the Russian to the house above the shore. I saw that the round knobs that stood on stakes by Chris's door were not ornamental but were symbolic. Food for thought, and also for vultures. It would have been even more impressive, those heads on the stakes, if their faces had not been turned to the house. Silence. 
suddenly round the corner of the house, a group of natives appeared. As though they had come up from the ground. They waded waist deep in the grass in a compact body bearing an improvised stretcher in their midst. Now, at last, I was to see Kurt. Behind the stretcher, two of the agents carried his arms. Two shotguns, a heavy rifle, and a light revolver carbine. The thunderbolts of that pitiful Jupiter. By now I knew what I watched was not merely the departure of Mr. Kurtz from the inner station, but the last jungle rites of one who had become its supreme being. Dark warm of the wilderness breathed out an immense horde of naked men. A black serpent that writhed and stamped around the small white center of frightened Europeans. In the rear of this strange procession came a moving chain of black bodies, carrying on their shoulders the gleaming white ivory. Stretcher was carried up the gangplank. From the pilot's deck, I looked down on the long, gaunt figure of Kurt hollow cage of his ribs, the bald skeleton head like an ivory ball. Put him down, put him down there. Get the captain ready. Open the door. Careful with him, careful. A moment later, the manager came up to the pilot's bridge. Oh, Captain Marlowe. Yes? I think we should steam up as soon as the ivory is loaded. No telling about these natives. Mr. Kurt. Mr. Kurt. He's a very sick man. We've done all we could for him, though, haven't we? But there's no disguising the fact that Mr. Kurtz has been more harm than good to the company. There's a remarkable quantity of ivory. But his methods have been unsound. You call it unsound methods? Without doubt, don't you? No methods at all. But he got the ivory. I consider Mr. Kurtz a remarkable man. He was, he was. A most remarkable man. swung downstream, and thousands of eyes from the jungle followed the splashing river demon beating the water with its terrible tail and breathing black smoke into the air. Through the dense forest, the brown current ran swiftly out of the heart of darkness, bearing us down towards the sea with twice the speed of our progress upstream. And Kurtz's life was running swiftly too, ebbing out of his heart into the sea of inexorable time. Evenings, when the boat was anchored and I was free from the wheel, I went down to Kurtz's cabin. On the third night, I found him weakening fast. Yes. How are you tonight, Mr. Kurtz? Weary enough to be back at my station. That place is mine. You have no right to take me away. That manager, that stupid scoundrel. He wants my ivory. He's blocked me at every turn. Don't excite yourself, Mr. Kurtz. You're sick, you know. Sick? Sick? Not so sick as you'd like to believe. Never mind. I'll carry out my ideas yet. I will return. I'll show you what can be done here. You with your little peddling notions. You're interfering with me. I will return. I have more to do than 
die here in this stinking jungle. You're not going to die, Mr. Curry. Of course I'm not going to die. I have too much to accomplish. Close the shutter, will you? That light. Did you close the shutter, Mr. Marlowe? Well, the shutter is closed, sir. Tighter, tighter. I can't stand the light. I tell you. You must show them you have in you something that is really profitable. The methods you use aren't important. I, I was driven. Uh, no matter. You must take care of the motives, Mr. Morrow. Right motives, always. That's the thing. Very true, sir. It was the manager, that noxious fool who drove me to it. He cried into my boxes when I was not looking. He destroyed me with the company. But I was the company. I I was the company. I sent them more ivory. More ivory. That's what they wanted. Ivory. You, you must be quiet, sir. Ivory. That light, sir, that, that light. There is no light, sir. It's the ivory. The ivory. Horror. Horror. The next day, soon after dawn, they lowered his body into a muddy hole in the bank of the murky river. He started downstream again. Among his belongings was a packet of letters and the photograph of a girl. Six months later, those letters and the picture took me to a house in Antwerp. I stood before the mahogany door on the first floor. You're Mr. Marlowe. Please come in. I, I have certain letters for you. Yes. You were his friend. You must have been if he gave you these. He sent you to me. Yes. I was his friend. Who was not his friend who had heard him speak once? Who drew men towards him by what was best in him? It was the gift of the great. But you have heard him. You know. Yes. I know. And all of this, all of his promise, and of all his greatness, of his generous mind, of his noble heart, nothing remains. Nothing but a memory. You and I... We shall always remember him. And his example. Men looked up to him. His goodness shone in every act. I believe in him more than anything on earth. Forgive me. I've mourned so long in silence. In silence. You were with him to the last. At the very end. I heard his very last words. Repeat them. I want... I want something. Something to live with. His last word. To live with. Don't you understand? I loved him. I loved him. I loved him. The last word he pronounced was... Your name.
friend Marlowe ceased. The story was over. Nobody moved for a time. Well, we've lost the first of the ebb. I raised my head. The offing was barred by a black bank of clouds. And the tranquil waterway leading to the uttermost ends of the earth flowed somber under an overcast sky and seemed to lead into the heart of an immense darkness. Orson Welles and the Mercury Theater on the Air have just brought you an original dramatization of The Heart of Darkness by Joseph Conrad with Orson Welles as the author and as court. The Columbia Broadcasting System and its affiliated stations are presenting Orson Welles and the Mercury Theater on the Air in two famous stories dramatized for radio. And here again is Orson Welles. Our radio adaptation of Life with Father is nothing more than a selection of our favorites from among those tales that Clarence Day swore were true about Clarence Day Sr. Life with Father is, of course, too good for us and too good to resist. As radio writers, we promise not to touch, but do just let us read it to you aloud. And finally, may I say that any similarity in the following broadcast to persons in real life is just as it should be. Up to the late 1890s, we lived in one of the long rows of comfortable-looking brownstone houses on Madison Avenue. Father went downtown each morning on the 6th Avenue elevated, but Mother felt that horse cars were better. She didn't like the soot and cinders from the steam engine that pulled the four passenger cars and the toot of the whistle made her nervous. No telegraph poles were allowed on 5th Avenue, but they stood in long rows on other thoroughfares. We had wires in our house, but they were good, honest, old-fashioned wires, and to make them work, we had to pull them. There was none of this dangerous stuff called electricity in them. Electricity was too risky a thing to put in a home. All we knew about it was that there were electric batter batteries in the Eden Musée, which could and did give anyone who paid 25 cents a shock. Telephones had been invented, but like most people, Father hadn't installed one. Messenger boys were quite enough of a nuisance, suddenly appearing at the door and expecting an answer, but they came only a few times a year, and a telephone might ring every week. Little by little, however, telephones came into use, and after about 10 or 15 years, in spite of still having misgivings, Father got one. It was put on a wall on the second floor where everybody could hear its loud bell from the first. I can assure you it made trouble. I'm coming. I'm coming. I'll go. I'll go. I'll answer the cursed thing. Uh, hello. Hello. Well, speak up. Can't you hang it? What is it? Who are you? I can't hear a word you're saying. I... I can't hear a blasted word, I tell you. Here, give me that telephone. You know you don't know how to use it. I will not give you this. I will not give you this telephone. You let me alone. I'm trying to find out who the devil this person is. Hello. I say hello there. You hear me? Who are you? Hello. What's that? Oh, oh, it's you, Mrs. Nichols. Yes, Mrs. Day's here. How are you? Oh, oh you wish to speak to Mrs. Day. Oh, very well, then. Wait a moment. Vinny, Vinny, it's for you. It's uh, Mrs. Nichols. Why don't you answer the telephone yourself, my dear? One day, a friend of mine, a girl who had moved to live in a settlement house downtown, telephoned to invite me to lunch with some visiting Russians. Father answered the telephone. Hello? Hello? Yes? This is Mrs. Day. Speak up. Hang it. Don't mumble at me. Who are you? What? I'm to lunch. I've had lunch. Next Friday, why? 
don't want to lunch with you next Friday. No. Where? Where do you say? In Rivington Street, the devil. Yes, my name is Clarence Day, and I told you that before. Don't repeat. Lunch with you in Rivington Street? Good Lord, I never heard of such a thing in my life. Russians. I don't know any Russians. No, I don't want to either. No, I haven't changed. I never change. What? Goodbye, madam. Blast. I think that was a friend of mine, Father. A friend of yours? Oh. Well, it sounded to me like some impudent peddler's wife this time arguing with me about lunching with her somewhere down in the slums. I can't stand it, that's all I have to say. I'll have the confounded thing taken out. <laughs> One day, when I was about ten years old, and my brother George, eight, father suddenly remembered an intention of his to have us taught music. Now, there were numerous things he felt every boy ought to learn, such as swimming, blacking his own shoes, and bookkeeping. He now recalled that music, too, should be included in our education. He held that all children should be taught to play on something and sing. But, Father, I can't sing. It's very simple, Clarence. Of course you can sing. It's the natural expression for a child. But, Father, I have no ear. Do you know when I tried to learn the piano? Nonsense, nonsense. Now, here. This game. Do, re, mi, fa, do, la, mi, do, do, re, mi, fa, do, la, mi, do. You sing it, I'll come to you. But, Father, I can't sing. Nonsense, my boy. What do you know about what you can or can't do? Just do whatever I tell you and you'll be all right. Do, do, do. Once again. Do. No. No, no, do. I'm sorry, Father. I don't understand exactly. Don't understand? Don't understand what? It's perfectly simple. You just sing now. Do. But, Father, you see, your voice matches the piano. I don't know how to make mine. All right, then. Try to learn one note at a time. If you can't sing the whole scale, just sing do. Do. Once again. Do. do. But, Father, it doesn't mean anything. Do. It's a note, don't you understand? A note in music. Try again now. Do. 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 Claire, what are you doing? What am I doing, Vinnie? Can't you hear what I'm doing? I'm trying to teach your oldest son to sing. Hey, Claire, can't you hear how it sounds? Would you please go away, my dear, and leave me alone with my son? If his voice is painful to you, go away. You can't hear it. But Claire. Dash it, I will not be interfered with. I'm sick and tired of being systematically thwarted and hindered in my own house. Can't stand another moment. Think I can't teach him? You teach him. You only have to come right back down again with soup being put on the table. I don't want any dinner. Oh, Claire, please. It's oyster soup. Don't want any. So we sat down, frightened at table. Mother, my brother George, and I... The soup was a lifesaver. It was more like a stew, really. Milk and oyster juice and big oysters. I put lots of small, hard crackers into mine and a slice of French toast. The hot toast soaked in soup was delicious. Only there wasn't much of it. And as Father particularly liked it, we had to leave it for him. Father came down in the middle of it, still offended, but he ate his full share father was often offended when he tried to teach us boys things, but not as badly as when he tried to teach mother. Father was always trying to teach mother to keep track of the household expenses. But Claire, I do try. Upon my soul, I almost believe you don't know what system is. You don't want to know either. Now, here, for instance. Here in my notebook, I see that I gave you six dollars in cash on the 25th of last month to buy a new coffee pot. Yes, but you broke the old one. You threw it right on the floor. I'm not 
talking about that, Vinny. I'm simply endeavoring to find out from you if I can. But it's so silly what? to break a nice coffee pot, Claire, and that was the last of those French ones. I spent four and a half dollars for that new umbrella. I told you I wanted, and you said I didn't need a new one, but I did very much. And that must have been the week I paid in just Tobin for an extra two days washing, so that makes six fifty. And that's another six fifty cents you owe me. I don't owe you anything, Vinny. You have managed to turn a coffee pot for me into an umbrella for you. If this sort of thing keeps on, I just well, not keep account books at all. Oh, Father sighed and got out his pencil and wrote. New umbrella for V in his notebook. <laughs> sort of thing left him very discouraged. Father got annoyed with us when he didn't stay well. He usually stayed well himself. And he expected us to be like him and not to faint and slump on his hands and thus add to his burdens. All this talk about germs, a lot of newfangled nonsense. When I was a boy, there were no germs that I knew of, and if they do exist, what of it? I'm as healthy as they are. Benny, blasted germs, want to have a try at me? Bring them on! <laughs> Aside from colds, which he had very seldom, his only foes were sick headaches. When one of these headaches started, Father laid down and shut his eyes tight and yelled. The severity of a headache could be judged by the volume of sound he put forth. His idea seemed to be to show the headache he was just as strong as it was and stronger. When he and the headache went to bed together, they were a noisy pair. From father's point of view, mother didn't know how to handle an ailment. Even when she had a cold, he became fretful. He pished and pooed to himself and muttered that it was silly. He usually came up from office about five or six, and then he'd look around the house to find mother. It made his home feel queer and empty to him when she wasn't there. He'd go up to her room. The smell of witch hazel was in the air, mixed with spirits of camphor. On the bed, huddled under an afghan, mother lay still in the dark. Vinny? Are you there, Vinny? Go away. A what? Go away. Oh, go away. Good Lord. Claire. What is it? Won't you please shut my door again? After supper, he didn't seem to know what to do with himself, so he'd go up and stand at the foot of Mother's bed, look gloomy. What is it, Claire? Nothing, nothing. Well, for mercy's sake, don't st stand there looking like that, Claire. Well, what do you mean, looking like that? Oh, go away. When people are sick, they like to see a smile or something. I never will get well if you stand there and stare at me that way. Please shut my door quietly this time and leave me alone. Father came downstairs. He looked more cheerful. <clears throat> well, well, my boy. Mother's all right again. She isn't out of bed, but sounds much better this evening. One evening, Father found Mother worrying because Aunt Emma was sick with influenza. Oh, pooh, there's nothing the matter with Emma. You can trust people to get any ailment, whatever, that's fashionable. They hear a lot of other people having it, and the first thing you know, they get scared and think they have it themselves. Then they go to bed and send to the doctor. The doctor or poppycock. Well, but Claire, dear, if you were in charge of them, what would you do instead? Uh, cheer them up. Cheer them up. That's the way to cure them. Well, how would you cheer them up, darling? I... I tell them, Bah! One late afternoon, when Father came home from downtown, he found his home very much upset. Our cook had walked out and left us. I was a child of four, my brother George, too, and there was a new baby besides. Mother was ill. She hadn't been able to leave us to go to an agency. 
He was no hand at cooking a soap. The outlook for dinner was poor. Well, what do you intend doing, Vinny? What's become of us? Well, why don't you go dine at your club for once? Oh, ridiculous. I never dine at the club. I won't do it. Any time I can't have my dinner in my own home, this house is for sale. I'm ready to sell the place this very minute. If I can't live here in comfort, and we can all go and sit under a palm tree and live on bread, fruit, and pickles. I'll try to get to an agency in the morning, Claire. See what I can do. In the morning? Good heavens. Where is this place? I'm going there right now. So Father put on his hat and gloves and started out to the agency. There was nobody in the place except a woman sitting at a desk. Good day. Where are they? I beg your pardon, sir. What you Where do you with? keep them? I'm asking, where do you keep them? Well, the girls are in there, but the clients are not allowed in that room. If you will tell me the kind of position you wish me to fill for you, I'll have one of them come out. We don't know how that... But, sir, you simply mustn't go... You Father can't... had thrown open the door and gone in. There sat a crowd of girls, young and old, sickly and brawny, of all shapes and sizes. Father pointed his cane at a little woman in the corner who sat there with honest gray eyes, shrewd-looking and quiet. I'll take that one. But, sir, I don't even know what position you... Cook. Cook. But Margaret doesn't wish to be a cook. She wants... You can cook, can't you? I did cook for one family once, sir. But... Oh, of course she can cook. I knew at once she could cook. But you're going to take it anyhow, whether she cooked or not. What day would you wish her to come, and would you please give me your name? Name? Why should I give you my name? Come on, Margaret. You come right home with me now. Goodbye, ma'am. Margaret followed Father back, and he set her right down to the kitchen to cook dinner. I don't know why people make such a fuss about engaging new servants. It seems simple enough to me. And it was, too. Margaret stayed with us 26 years. And Margaret was just the kind of cook Father wanted. Lots of cooks can do rich dishes well. Margaret couldn't, but she cooked simple, everyday dishes in a way that made our mouths water. Father said her apple pies were the most satisfying he ever tasted. Her warmed-up potatoes were so delicious. He used sometimes to make a whole dinner of them, yet even Margaret sometimes miscalculated. A large, royal-looking steak would be set before Father, which upon being cut into would turn out to be underdone. Father's face would darken with disappointment. He would raise his foot under the table and stamp slowly and heavily three times on the rug. At this solemn signal, we could hear Margaret leaving the kitchen far below. Margaret? Yes, Mr. Day. Margaret, that's safe. Oh, the Lord bless us and save us. She would then seize the platter and make off off of it to better it the best way she could. Father would gloomily wait and eat a few vegetables and pour out a fresh glass of claret. But sometimes a dish came up that was so perfect that Father's face would crinkle with pleasure and with a wink at us he would summon Margaret... Yes, Mr. Day. Margaret, that fricassee chicken is good. Margaret would turn her wrinkled face aside and look down and push the platform out toward the father. The same gesture she used when she said, get along with you to flat. She couldn't say that to father, but she would lean at him and turn and roll out and dump back down the dark stairs without ever a word. In the end, Father had to get used to another cook because Margaret died. But often at meals, Father talked of how good her things always tasted. Well, this pie's good, Benny. Nobody could say it compared with Margaret's. I wish she could hear you. If anybody was ever sure of going to heaven, I know it was Margaret. Yeah, I'll look her up when I get there. Have her take care of me. But Claire. Well, what's the matter? Well, Claire, dear Margaret, you must be in some special sort of heaven she was so good. You'd be very fortunate, Claire, if you 
get to the same part of Margaret. Huh. I'll make a devil of a row if I don't. Tonight, the Columbia Broadcasting System has presented the 18th weekly hour featuring Orson Welles and the Mercury Theater on the air. In just a moment, Orson Welles will return to the microphone with an announcement regarding his future plans. Meanwhile, a word about tonight's production of two famous stories. Mr. Welles spoke for each of the authors as narrator. In The Heart of Darkness by Joseph Conrad, Ray Collins was featured as the narrator Captain Marlowe. The accountant was played by Alfred Shirley, the assistant manager George Caloris, the second manager Edgar Barrier, the agent William Allen, Kurtz's intended bride Anna Stafford, Cherkoso, Frank Rettig, Kurtz by Orson Welles. And the African music was directed by Asadata Dafora Horton, whose drummers have been heard in the African da- dance drama Kai Kunkor and Mr. Wells' production of Macbeth. The excerpts from Life with Father by Clarence Day, which concluded the program, featured the mother, Mildred Natwick, the employment office manager, Mary Wicks, Margaret Alice Frost, the boy, Clarence Arthur Anderson, father, Orson Welles. The orchestra was conducted by Bernard Herman, and Davidson Taylor supervised the production for CBS. This is Dan Seymour speaking. Next Sunday night at 8 o'clock Eastern Standard Time, Orson Welles and the Mercury Theater on the air will bring to life a modern story of romance and adventure. The story of a man who lost a great love and who could have no quiet and no sleep until he found that love again. The famous novel, One Life to the And now again, the star and director of the Mercury Theater, Orson Welles. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm happy at this time to announce that starting Friday, December 9th, from 9 to 10 p.m., and each Friday thereafter, we of the Mercury Theater will be sponsored over most of these stations by the makers of Campbell's Soups. Good night. Broadcasting System.